you're going to get the best results from any team when the accountability is within the team itself, not coming from management. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Creative Table. With us today, we have Brad Bretz, the one and only, from North Point Ministries. He is the Creative Services Director and has quite a lot of wisdom he's going to impart to us. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Thanks for being here, Brad. Great to be here. <laughs> Just put wisdom. you on the spot. Yep. Wisdom. It's Lots all... of wisdom and knowledge and oh. wisdom and more wisdom. <laughs> Having worked with all these different creative types, hmm. um, <laughs> I, I know there's a whole treasure trove of information in that head of yours. And so we're going to try to get some of that out today. I just want to, <laughs> you have dealt with uh, the whole gamut, as you said, or, or led, led uh, you know, a talent of all shapes and sizes, and you've built teams over almost two decades now. So, mm. oh um, man, that's a long time. I know. I'm, <laughs> look at that beautiful silver hair. It's just really, <laughs> no, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on, um, I know, from an experiential side for you, and, and I would love to just kind of land a little bit on this idea of, hmm. of teams, team management, team mm -hmm. leadership, developing, <clears throat> cultivating a healthy team, staying creative as a team, stay, staying just above board, you know, full of integrity and, and drive and focus. And that's something that sounds easy. I, I know it's certainly easier said than done, hmm. um, but I mean, Let's just go back to, I guess, if you could, just your first few years leading at, at North Point. I mean, what were some of the immediate lessons that you learned or takeaways? And I know you've got a pretty cool backstory around mm. um, maybe football that might yeah. help explain some of this. But <laughs> um, so again, growing up, I love sports. I love music. I did both. Um, mm -hmm. And in high school, I played um, football, I tried out my sophomore year. I didn't try out my freshman year. I played a lot of flag football. Parents, I played flag football for as long as I can remember until high school. That's when I first hit tackle. Mm -hmm. So tackle football, sophomore year, junior year, barely saw the field. Senior year, they needed a quarterback. Okay. And I threw a ball one day and they said, wow, you can throw. You're going to be our quarterback next year. This is when high school football was, it was Silicon Valley. And they, they basically saw something in me. And I was tall. I was 6'4". Um, as, a my, as a senior. As a senior. Uh, okay. Junior slash senior. Yeah, I was yeah. growing. Um, I think I was all of about a buck 60. I'm going to sit up really at straight. 6'4". I'm feeling so short <laughs> right now. Okay. Um, anyways, so I played uh, quarterback my senior year yep. and handed off the ball a lot. No colleges referenced me, noted me, anything except for the junior college that was in town. And um, that coach saw me. Like I love this. I've never heard this story. Yeah, yeah it's, this is great. I thought I was going to be giving up football. And um, my brother, uh, who's a tight end, he's uh, he played tight. He was one of my tight ends in, in sophomore year. Okay. Um, he played at a school called Cal State Hayward. Now it's called Cal State East Bay. Um, my alma mater had its name changed. Mm. <laughs> So um, uh, they kind of recruited me with a Bob's Big Boy meal and a pair of cleats. There you like, go. Let's do this. And um, so they recruited me, and uh, I ended up playing two years of college football at Cal State Hayward and did my junior year, played really well. <clears throat> and then my senior year, I was 11th ranked college quarterback in the nation uh, for D2, for Division Two. Okay. And then one day at practice... There was a guy taking notes, and I didn't know who he was, what he was doing. I said, Coach, who's that guy over there? And he turned to me, and he said, that's a scout from the Minnesota Vikings here to scout you. <laughs> I was like, really? And that was about the third That made your game. stomach go, ooh. Okay. <clears throat> that made me think about every single pass I was throwing, everything oh, yeah. I was doing. That was the first time I thought or even realized it was a possibility to play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And I had the right height. I had a strong arm. Um, and I was a little bit of, I just wasn't on a whole lot of people's grids. But once you get on one scout's grid, yeah. it tends to, okay, who else, who else? And so some additional st scouts came and, um, over the course of the season. And there was a guy uh, from the Cowboys. Anyway, so long story short, I got signed with the Dallas Cowboys after college um, okay. as a free agent. I didn't get drafted. I was an undrafted free agent. Okay. Tony Romo was an undrafted free agent, um, but that was my role. So I literally 
came from college football where we're 5,600 people at a game to a preseason game to the Dallas Cowboys where there's 60,000 people in the stand, 60,000 yeah, people. And it was crazy. Just the first practice with the Cowboys had more people at it than my yeah college, college game. <laughs> Um, like all your college games probably combined or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was I got signed to the Cowboys the year after they won their first Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So this was a team that was inc just incredible glue to them. I came in and watching this team and there was no, there was no us versus them. There was no we versus them. It was because when you break down us versus them, it's me versus you. It's I'm more important than you. Mm. And in that, I saw the relationship between you know Troy and the defensive backs and receivers and Troy Aikman. Mm -hmm. um, I got to work with Troy Aikman, Jason Garrett, who uh, was the former head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Jason Garrett and I were fighting for the number three spot uh, with the Cowboys. And he was just so smart. Princeton guy, just super smart. Everybody there was just incredibly talented. Um, and one of the things that Jimmy Johnson, the head coach at the time, he took all the rookies into the room. And the thing that he did, which I thought the team modeled really well, he took all of us rookies into the room. And again, I'm Brad from Cal State Hayward, Division II, 5,600 people mm -hmm. at a game. He takes all the rookies and says, hey, congratulations. You're part of the Dallas Cowboys. Um, here's my expectations. I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care how many Rose Bowl rings you have. I don't care how many SEC championships you have. Your job is to produce. And if you don't produce for me, I'm going to cut you. <laughs> and so there was an expectation there that obviously was really quick of going, okay, got to produce. And that's, I mean, it's football, it's professional football. You got to produce. But what he did do for somebody like me was he even the playing field. I'm sitting here going, wow, here's this guy with the SEC championship. Here's this guy that came from you know Arizona State. Here's this guy that came from all these schools that were bigger than me. You're right. But for me. But in terms of equal, you're all equal. Everybody's yeah. like, now you're a part of the Dallas Cowboys. Right. And we're going to go win some ball games. And yep. you're either going to get on this train or you're going to be left off. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredible journey. And the thing that modeled that for me from a player standpoint, <clears throat> and I would say this for any team, any creative team, any sports team, you're gonna get the best results from any team when the accountability is within the team itself, not coming from management, not coming from up high. It's gonna be from when the players around you and the people around you expect more from you than you do. Mm -hmm. That is one of the biggest things that I think I learned with the Dallas Cowboys and they showed it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, if there's something from the creative world that um, I think that we can continue to instill and, and obviously over 17 years, there's a lot of top down, including me. It's like, hey, let's push that. Let's make that better. Let's, you know, I think there's a part of that. But when you have a team that is surrounded by people that make each other better, that push each other and what if, and, and what if we try this and hey, I'm, I'm getting a sense of this or mm -hmm. what were you thinking about that? Um, as a creative leader, there's just nothing better. Mm -hmm. And when hiring those people that are gonna push and challenge each other or everybody knows, hey, we're hiring somebody that's a little bit green. And because they're green, you know, let's continue to make them better. Let them ask questions. Let them mm -hmm. ask questions of what you're doing because I mean, everybody has an opportunity to lead. Mm -hmm. Everybody, no matter where you're at, um, I mean, Clay Scroggins wrote the book, Leading When You're Not in Charge. Mm -hmm. um, Here in this idea of a healthy culture, I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, you've all, you're only as good as your team and your team is only as good as the culture that they're in. Mm. But how do you build that culture? How do you make sure that, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, as long as everyone supports each other, it's great. It's like, well, how do you, how do you open up the opportunity for people to feel comfortable bringing their full self to the table? I know Zappos, Tony Shea of Zappos, mm -hmm. um, changed the game back in the day with their customer service and their commitment to the customer, but they also were able to do that because of the culture they had built around that from on the, from the, you know, their, their corporate yeah. end. So, but one of the things they, that Tony talks about is this idea of you let the, the person 
bring, like if you have a, t a person who's a creative or maybe they're working in accounting, but they're also a musician. It's like, let the accountant, you know, bring the guitar yes. into the office. Mm -hmm. Let them play a little bit during the day to keep their head clear or whatever. Like, let them bring all of who they are to work and contribute that. And it, I think the value is, um, yeah. you know, there's something exponential that happens. Um, but yeah, what, what would you speak to that? I mean, what would you have to say to that? Uh, um, it, don't forget, every culture it is a culture and the, and the unique people in it bring something special. Yeah. Um, not every culture is for every person. Mm -hmm. In other words, I know there's probably some type A's that walk into a Zappos coach and oh, go, yeah. wait a second. Why, why is there like decorations on the ceiling? Yeah, like wait, tennis I'm trying, shoes to, get, on the trying to get work done and there's a guitar guy playing next to me <laughs> and I got pets and whatever. Wait yeah. a second, how am I supposed yeah, to yeah, get yeah. Um, I think clarity in establishing any culture, there has to be clarity. Yeah. What's the expectations? Um, part of working in North Point Creative Services, um, we're into the details. We are into the details. And when we do reviews of things, 80% mm -hmm. is, okay, we, let's make sure we're getting to the, bring us the 80%. 80 I break it into 80, 15, and 5. 80, 15, okay. and 5. 80% is, okay, we're doing the story. Ah, the story's there. We got the story. Now let's work on the 15 of, okay, what is really going to punch this up? What is the thing we really need? What is that? And that's through kind of our story review, or we have, um, you know, twice a week, we try to as best we can twice a week, we have a review and everybody sits around and all things being equal. I have to be careful. Other leaders have to be careful of their voices because they carry a little bit more weight. Mm -hmm. Meaning when you say something, it's like, okay, well, that's going to get changed because the leader said, you know, right. We have to be careful of that, but really it's, um, it's a time for everybody to speak into things, but that's also where creative leadership is at its um, most important, it's at its best. Meaning if I've created something and I'm working on a project, I'm leading that project, I'm hearing a lot of things being said. Mm -hmm. It's my job as a creative leader to go, which thing that was said do I need to apply? That's right. And how do you know? And mm -hmm. well, and it's up to the creative leader to go, mm -hmm. this is going to push it forward. This is, that's a great idea. Ooh, I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I, this, yeah, so I don't have the money for that. Don't or, have the money for yeah, that. Right. Um, and it has to be careful because some people go straight technical. Oh, that camera and this and that. And then some people go story. Mm -hmm. And it's just evaluating that, trusting those who you're around. If you don't have a culture that has trust, it's um it's just doomed yeah. to fail yes um, and you're gonna days lose are people numbered. yeah days are numbered um so i think the, the clarity side of it is so important of here's what's expected yes details matter mm -hmm. um we want you to create your best work while you're here um we want you to trust those that are around you mm -hmm. um i don't want and this is probably the thing that i took from the cowboys is that i don't want to create an us and them i do not want to create an us and them with our clients and when I say clients, our churches. And our churches, without them, we don't exist. <laughs>